as you can see on the screen, the title, The Problem of Sin, The Problem of Sin. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. And Lord, you know that I am not able, but you are able today to speak to your people. May your name be exalted. May your name be praised in your house. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The problem of sin. And some of you may have, and I'm going to let you be able to read along with me today. Some of you, all of a sudden, I have no screen. Okay, there you go. I don't know if you can read it, but... Russia has invaded Ukraine. That's no news to you. You've been glued to the TV. The war is on as events daily unfolds. The world watches breathlessly to see the outcome. It's awful. It is awful. People are dying on both sides. Prayers are going up. Fires are going up, Amen. and surely God is still working to save the lost. Is this war part of Bible prophecy? That's the question. Is this war part of Bible prophecy? Okay, you Bible student. Is this war a part of Bible prophecy? Where can I find that? Where can I find that? Real quick. Matthew 24. All right. You're, you're a Bible student for, for real. Matthew 24 tells us. There, yes, this war is a sign among signs predicted by Jesus Christ himself. And you will hear of wars, wars and rumors of wars. And what did Jesus say after that? Read it again loudly. Some of us have a tendency to worry. And Jesus is saying, see that you are not troubled. As Christians, we should know that the time of the hand, we are going to see turmoil, upheaval, all these wars and rumors of wars. We shouldn't be troubled about it. And yet, is God surprised about this? No, Jesus himself said it. War broke out. Where? God is no stranger to war. War broke out in heaven. We see right there in Revelation chapter 12. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. The dragon and his angel fought back. That's war. But they did not prevail. Now was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And the Bible tells us right there, the, the dragon was cast out. The serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Just in case you don't know who, it's, who it is, the Bible is making it crystal clear who this dragon is, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the hurt, and the angels were cast out with him. Right, we're, we're going somewhere, and we, we, we're going to the next thing, and we see that some people are equating this war in Ukraine to Armageddon. Yes, some people are actually equating it, referring to it as Armageddon. What does the Bible say about Armageddon? What does the Bible say? Let's go to the Bible. Revelation chapter 16, let's turn to it. The Bible says something about Armageddon, and it has no reference to Ukraine or Russia. Let's go to it so we can understand exactly. And by the way, this is just a preamble to the sermon. This is really not the sermon. You're getting a double dose today. Sorry. <laughs> Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 12. 
and the context of Revelation chapter 16. I want us Bible students to look at this context here because this is important. When someone asks you and try to pigeonhole us into thinking that this is Armageddon starting, let's have it in the context of the scripture. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12 says what? The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Bible students, what does water represent? Keep that in mind. Right? The sixth angel. So remember, we're going, this is the, 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 the plagues, the seven last plagues being poured out. Do we see plague number two yet? How can we get to plague number six? If we haven't started at plague number one yet. So how can Armageddon be now when plague number one hasn't started yet? If you go back to Revelation chapter 16, starting at verse 1, it's that laying out all the plagues that's going to be poured out. So how can we get to number six plague before we get to number one plague? So logically, this war in between Ukraine and Russia cannot be Armageddon. And if we continue reading, we'll understand even more that it cannot even be Armageddon when every army in the world get together and start fighting. It still can't be Armageddon. Let's read on. Let's read on. And verse 13, And I saw the three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Who is the dragon? Satan. And, and out of the mouth of the beast. Who is the beast? The Roman Catholic system. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. All of these false prophets preaching all these falseness on the internet. All of them. All of your favorite preachers that preach false prophets. They're false prophets. That's what the Bible calls them. For they are the spirits of demons. Performing what? Performing what? Signs which go out to the kings of the earth and so it's not just the kings, not just the kings. I want us to look at this because some people are saying the kings of the herd are going to gather, gather in Israel and fight the Armageddon. Look at the text. What it says, the kings and who else? Can the whole world fit, fit in, in Israel? So logically speaking, can that be applicable to a location? So let, let's get it straight so we understand when someone comes with foolishness, that's not scripture. We can point them to the scripture and say, that is not in the Bible. Yes. Amen? Yes. All right. I think we understand now. We're, we're going to move on to the true subject that we have today. Uh, behold, I'm coming. Jesus is speaking. If, you, if your Bible is in color, you'll see. Sorry if you're reading one of those uh, fancy tablets. It may not have color. <laughs> behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who... Watch his and keep his garments. Lest what? Lest you walk naked with these foolish teachings from these false prophets. And they see your shame. And verse 16. And they gathered them together to the place called in the Hebrew Armageddon. That's the only place in the Bible you'll find this word. Revelation chapter 16 verse 16. That's the only place... In the Bible that you'll find the word Armageddon. This word, this word is, is what? This word is symbolic. Meaning, this word does not have a literal application on any place, physical place on planet Earth. This is a symbolic reference to the last war. To the last war that will be fought. When, God, when Jesus Christ come down and destroy who? His enemies. That's it. Armageddon, the word sounds scary because Hollywood has taken Armageddon and turned it into movies to, to deceive the world, to help Satan deceive the whole world. And so let's understand 
as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, to know what is the true meaning of the word Armageddon. It's the last what? The last battle, the final battle that is going to be, God is going to finally put his enemies to rest. Right? Now let's turn to the problem of sin. Because what we're seeing in the war and all the rumors of war, what is the reason for that? Sin. Sin is the, the root cause. The root cause is sin. What is sin? Bible student, what is sin? Where can I find that? Where can I find that? 1 John 3, verse 4. You got the cheat sheet right there. So sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. Although many may deny the reality of sin, although many may re deny the reality of sin, it can be seen everywhere. It is manifested on large scale in wars, ethnic cleansings, terrorism, etc. And also, sin is a reality in our very own lives. In our very own lives, we need the Savior to save us. So we look at a couple instances. Who is a sinner? Who is a sinner? We are all sinners. We are all sinners. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one can boast and say, I am holy. Only Jesus has the authority to say that. And that's why we need to be covered by his blood. Because all our righteousness, when God looks at our righteousness, he sees filthy rags. So until we're covered with the blood of Jesus, whatever good we do in God's eyes, just filthy rags. Our, our goodness can't save us. We need the blood of Jesus Christ to save us. If we allow sin, if we allow sin to rule our lives, If we allow sin to rule our lives, many of our prayers will go unanswered. And the work of the church will not move forward. I want us to turn our Bibles to Judges. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. This is the story of Joshua going up against, did I say Judges? Yeah. It's Joshua. Joshua chapter 7, sorry. Joshua chapter 7. Children of Israel, they're going up against another enemy. Now, I want to just give you a little background. This is coming right after they have defeated Jericho. If you read chapter 6 of, jo of, of, of Joshua, you will see they have just defeated Jericho. And if you read the chapter, you'll see that that was a momentous victory. Yes. Jericho was a walled city. Yes. The people of Jericho felt as if nothing could penetrate their city. They were actually up on the walls, mocking the children of Israel. But God had told Joshua that this city is yours. This city is yours. God instructed Joshua what to do. What did he do? What's the instruction? March around the city seven days. Seven days. Day one, just go around it one time. Day two, one time. Day three, one time. And so on. And can you imagine those people in the city and the wall looking, saying, what are those crazy 
Israelites doing with trumpet blowing and walking with this, I don't even know what that thing they have walking with. They look like some dummies. Day six, one time. Day seven, here comes the surprise. Seven times. Well, I would imagine those who are mocking, the first time they go around, they said, no, they're not going back this time. They keep going. They're going again. Number six. Number seven, there was a special instruction on number seven. What were they to do? They were to shout when they hear the trumpet blow. And they shouted. Now, think about it for a minute. You don't have any missile. <laughs> you don't have any missile. All you have is your voice to blow, to make noise. But yet, this fortified city, the walls came tumbling down. The message for us in this part of the story is, let God fight your battles. Let God fight your battles. Because all we need to do is just listen to what he tells us to do. Shout if he says shout. March around the walls if he says march around the wall. Just do what he says. But there was an instruction in chapter 6 that says all of the gold, all of the silver, all of the brands must go to the house of the Lord. That was instruction. But there was one person who decided that he couldn't bear to see all that gold going into the temple to storage. I got to get my hands on some of that. So we, we, we come to verse, with chapter 7 is where chapter 7 starts. But the children of Israel, verse 1, the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of, of the tribe of Judah, took up the accursed things so that the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Saints, that's why it's so important for us as a church, individually and collectively, to confess our sins to God. Not to hide them at home. Whatever it is, we're struggling with different tr tr troubles, Confess and ask God for help. He will give us the victory. And we see here, Joshua sent men. So now, fresh off the battle, they felt like they are invincible. They went to the next. He sent men to spy out the next con uh, country. And what did they come back and tell them? Oh, these are just a few little men. They can't beat us. We can, we can beat them. We can beat them down. They didn't even take the time to see what God has to say. They felt so confident that they can just take these little people down. And what happened? They went, and they were sorely disappointed. This is what happens when we, we are self-confident, and we don't consult with God. We don't check with God to see if all is well with him. So they came back. 36 men died because they didn't check with God. And Joshua and the people, they were, verse 5, verse 5, and the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So after new victory, now they are defeated. 
by perceived weak nation. I hope Russia is listening. Then Joshua tore his clothes, verse 6. He tore his clothes and fell to the hurt on his face before the Lord, the ark of the Lord, until evening. And he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. They're mourning. But God is going to tell him something. Verse 10, verse 10, the Lord so the Lord said to Joshua, get up. That's why it's important to listen to the Lord. Because sometimes when we are mourning and groaning, God is saying, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. You see how serious sin is? One man took what was instructed not to be taken and now the entire camp is suffering. That's how serious sin is. God's instruction need to be obeyed. Some of us, as some people may call it legalism. Yes it is. God is a legalist. What he says, he was his mean. That's, that's what legalism is. Whatever he says, that's what he expects. If he wasn't a legalist, then he would be wishy-washy. He said this, and you do this, and he's okay with it. But he's going to hold us accountable for our actions. If he says, don't eat the fruit, there's no compromise in that. God, can I just take a little bite? No, there's no compromise in don't do. Plain and simple. And parents, you know when you told your children, you expect them to do what you told them. So why should we expect anything less from God? Anyhow, let's move on. So we see one man's sin. One man's sin caused the destruction or the defeat of the Israelites' army. But God has a plan. God had a plan. We are going to cleanse this, this sin from the camp. And it's amazing, it's amazing that God was with these Israelites, showing them in so many ways how he's working. God allowed each tribe to pass by, and he picked out the tribe. Then he allowed each family to pass by and he picked out the family and then he what he picked out the man this is the sinner who disobeyed God and there's a consequence for sin there's a consequence for sin as we go into Romans chapter chapter 6 verse 23 there's a consequence for sin and, and before we go there let's, let's take a quick look at some of the sin of the flesh we have adultery, because sometimes we say sin and we may, we may think it's a concept that is, we don't quite understand. We see the picture right there? Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. What else? Jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions. Dissensions, hearses, envies, murders, drunkenness, and it, the list continues. There are some other categories of sin that are not listed here. You might be wondering, where is thou shalt not steal? Some sin, some sin are or some commands are explicit, like thou shalt not. And some are implicit. It's not spoken, but you understand that is what God expects. And so this is some of the implicit commands that God expects us to obey. Some are mixed in with some explicit ones, but God expects us to be holy. 
If we are his children, he expects holiness from us. That's the found in Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21. What is the consequence of sin? What is the consequence of sin? We just kind of gave you a cheat sheet on that. What is the consequence of sin? Sin. The wage of sin is, is death. Romans 6, 23. That's the consequence. That's the ultimate consequence. And unfortunately today, so many believe that because there is no immediate consequence, they can just continue sinning and just pretend as if there will be no consequence. But the Bible will not lie. God is going to bring every work into judgment. With every secret thing. Whether it is good or whether it is evil. And there are some other, other consequences that we can actually see some effects from immediately. As Christians, this is, we're, we're talking about ourselves now. Our prayers can be hindered when we are, we are harboring, we are not confessing our sins before God. Our prayers. We pray, but we don't see anything happen. Why? Because our sin is preventing our prayers from going up to God. I'm not making that up. That is in the Bible. Next, our, the, our power will be limited. As we see in the story of Joshua, they had no power to overcome this little weak nation because of sin. And finally, we, our prosperity will be limited. We can't prosper when we are harboring sin in our lives. Whatever that sin is, we know we need to confess it to God. Some of the sins are just personal to ourselves. When we're doing it by ourselves, we know what it is. Search me, O oh Lord, and try me. And see if there's any wicked way in me and cleanse me. That should be our prayer. What is the solution? I don't want to just leave you with consequences and results. What is the solution to the sin problem? What is the solution? What? Jesus is the solution. He is. And Paul tells us right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. We should all say amen on that. Jesus Christ took on the penalty for our sins so that we can put on the, his righteousness and can be accepted in the family of God. Amen. Amen. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to what? Yes. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God wants to cleanse us, but we have to do our part. He wants to cleanse us, but we have to do our part. As we, as we look at examining our hearts, I can't examine your heart. I can't. This is an individual thing. We have to search our own heart and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. So once we search, we, the, next, the next step is what? Confessing. What is confessing? Telling God what you've done. That's what confessing is. Next. Repent. Repent. What is repent? What is repent? Turn it and go in the other way. That's repent. So first, we examine ourselves, our heart, confess our sins. Then we repent. What's the next step? Resolve. It's not, in, it's not in the scripture, but the resolve is, is the resolution that we're going to make to be determined. To be determined to be faithful to God. To stand up for what God has says to us. 
to not lean this way nor that way, not compromise in any way, but to stand firm in what God has said. God says, don't touch the accursed. Don't touch those things. Those things that um, that's not yours. You know, that Achan, he committed several sins. First of all, he stole. Well, actually, he coveted first. Then he stole. Then he lied. Because he hid it, he hid it in the camp. He was lying. He probably was digging the dirt where he buried it on Sabbath. I don't know. I'm just that one. Was, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, that one was. I couldn't help that one. Anyway, that one. Uh, you know, we we have a sin problem. We we today we come to examine our own lives. Where have we? sinned against God this week. This morning, where have we sinned? And if you don't think you have done anything to offend God, then the prayer needs to be, search me, O Lord. Try me. And see if there's any wicked way in me and cleanse me. Because sometimes we think we are so holy and we don't know that God is offended by us. Our righteousness make God want to puke. So we need to come to him like the publican and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Find, search me, Lord. Help me to remember all the things that I've done against you so that I can be one with you. God is seeking a relationship with us. The sin problem is going to go away one day. We will have Armageddon. No doubt about that. Jesus Christ is coming back. But until then, we have to live holy lives. We have to sit, live lives free of sin. And how do we do that? That is not our job to do. All we need to do is surrender. Say, Lord, I surrender to you. And that's a daily process. Daily, every day, wake up. Sir, Lord, please help me to surrender today. Because self gets in the way. Someone gets in your nerves and tests your surrendering. And so we need a fresh surrender moment by moment so God can make us and mold us into the likeness of Christ. We cannot do it on our own. We need Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, to give us the power to overcome sin. Whatever the sin is, God knows it, you know it, you know it. And we need to surrender to God. May God bless us today as we seek to be more like Jesus every single day. Let us, let us pray. If you have the desire to want to be a holy Christian today, you want to live holy, you want to rid yourself of any sin that is holding you down from having that awesome relationship with God, I invite you to stand with me this morning to indicate to God that I want to be a Christian in my heart. I want to be true to you in every way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures who can give us assurance and point us to our salvation, to the way of salvation. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that will give us the power to overcome sin. Lord, we know that one day soon, we will see your presence. Help us to be faithful to the end. Is our prayer in Jesus' name.